I thought he was going to let the I thought he was going to let you know the next city for a moment there. Apparently Pete's announced many cities as possibilities during this time and um, I know that there's a lot of our YWAM Perth guys that have been doing their own private research and um, it's possible that you all know that city already but uh, we haven't officially received our invitation yet. You know, I was really, um, really blessed tonight by uh, the, uh, the video that was done for the Dejerim camp and interested to hear that Heidi had said that they were sharing about identity issues and, um, you know, I've been wrestling for, the, for this past week with what God um, uh, wanted me to share tonight and really wondering whether actually the person that invited me had got it right in the first place that I should speak because I wasn't uh, finding it easy to get uh, this word from God. And uh, later, in to, later today, God finally spoke to me and he, he said, speak on identity and destiny. And I had no idea what was happening uh, somewhere else uh, with that uh, amazing camp that was going on. <laughs> I want to share a little bit about identity and destiny from the point of view um, that if we don't understand uh, what that is, uh, we can lose our way, uh, we cannot hang in there for the purposes of God, and uh, we can find ourselves out of what would be an incredible uh, place of history making for us, and, and just end up in a very ordinary life uh, that's not dedicated uh, to the purposes of God. So, uh, you know, with me... Um, you know, when I was as a young kid thinking of who am I, um, you know, I, I didn't have many answers to that. And asking a question like, what am I called to do? Uh, well, I had no answers to that. You know, I, I just basically sort of absorbed uh, whatever was going on around me. And uh, that's what I did. Uh, that's what I was about. Uh, you know, the who am I question uh, was a difficult one for me. And, um, you know, sometimes when you don't have the right people around you, it's kind of hard to work out who you are. And uh, it's kind of hard to work out whether uh, you being alive is important or significant or has meaning. And uh, when you don't have God as, uh, as, as the one that you can look at and discover those things from, then you tend to come to all the wrong conclusions and you believe whatever people say about you. And, you know, depending on what world you grew up in, you may, you know, if, you're, if you've grown up in a world like I did, then it wasn't positive, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, you're fantastic, you're doing great, uh, you know, we believe in you. It wasn't that type of communication. And so that affected how I saw myself. And it certainly affected uh, what I thought I might be called to do in life. Um, I had no uh, ambition uh, for one month ahead of me, let alone one year or a lifetime. Uh, but, you know, things changed. Uh, they changed big time when I came to know Jesus. And um, I began to understand that I was his girl and that I belonged and that he was a beautiful father and that he loved me and... And then when I began to understand love and I continued to hang around God, that began to give me an understanding of what I would do and what I was about and uh, what that would look like. You know, in the early days of uh, becoming a Christian, I, I started to read the book. And, um, you know, you start in Genesis, you read right through. Well, at least that's what I did. And, um, you know, in Genesis 1.26... Um, there's a scripture uh, where God's speaking and he says, let us make man in our own image. And I remember when I first read that scripture, I, I sort of, I just stopped. I absolutely stopped because I guess I didn't believe uh, that, you know, that could be for real, you know, that, that I and everybody that I know was actually made in the image of God because I'd already come to the conclusion that he was pretty fabulous, you know, but I hadn't yet come to the conclusion that, uh, that I was okay or that those around me were okay. And, you know, I used to think about it a lot, being made in the image of God. 
I remember a time when I thought about it way too much in one day. It was a lot of pressure to me because I thought if I'm made in the image of God, I'm meant to look like him. I'm meant to act like him. I'm meant to imitate him. And I knew at that moment in those early days of getting to know him, I was, I was far, far away from looking anything like him. But I knew I, I had been rescued and I knew I was loved. But I didn't quite know how to love back and I certainly didn't know how to love other people. But you know, this thing about this truth that human life begins with a relationship with created God. Because that's what it's really about, isn't it? When you're made in the image of God, your, your life begins with a relationship with God. So, so every little person that's born, they begin with a relationship with God before uh, we start to communicate with them in a way where they can talk back. They already have that relationship with God. They're, they're made in the image of God. And we learn uh, to walk away from God. We learn... Uh, not to know God in that intimate way. But God's purpose is that we begin with a relationship with Creator God. And so that Creator God said, let us make man in our image so that that relationship can be possible. And you know, that's the first thing about identity. That's the most important thing about our identity, is that we have the capacity and the ability and the joy and the privilege of having a relationship with Creator God. You know, when Pete was praying uh, earlier tonight after worship and he was getting us to think about how big God is and how amazing God is, but yet we have this incredible privilege of having a relationship with Creator God. We're born into that. God decided that. God wanted that. And, um, you know, I, I just, even as a very, very new Christian, I found that extraordinary because I'd already understood that he was holy, that, you know, I already, already got in my spirit that he was, you know, that there was this rare atmosphere, if you like, around God. I, I don't know if I called it holiness, because perhaps I didn't know too much about that, but he was rare. There was no one like him. But yet, you know, I could have a relationship with him. And, you know, really what, what that scripture is saying in Genesis 1.26 is he made us little copies of himself. Not big copies, not, not equal in size, but little copies of himself. And, um, you know, that's pretty cool, don't you think? A little copy of God, a little copy of himself. And he wanted us to live uh, in his circle of relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and also his larger circles of relationship with, with everybody that he's created. And he wants us to live in that, uh, in the same way that he lives in that, in the same way that he reaches out. And that is very important for us to understand because that's our identity. You know, that's first and foremost our identity, that we've been born to have that amazing relationship with God. And that's possible because we're little copies of him. And then he includes us in his relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect family, but also that extended family of you and I, that we have the privilege of being able to love one another, being able to actually talk to one another and care for one another. And, and that, that's part of how we express our identity to the world that we live in. You know, when, when Jesus came onto the earth and, you know, Pete led us through that prayer tonight as we were thinking about how great God was, when Jesus came, he, he began to call individuals to himself, didn't he? You know, exactly what happened in Genesis, Jesus began to do that as well. And he called individuals, they were an individual, that in fact, they were strangers, you know, and until they were called to Jesus, they didn't know one another, but they were called. I mean, there was a couple of brothers there, you know, a couple of family members, but apart from that, they were strangers to one another. So Jesus calls the individual. And, you know, you've heard the voice of God as an individual, and, and he's called you. That's part of your identity, that Jesus called you. He called you by name, and he called you to himself. 
And he invited you into relationships, his relationships. You know, very often when we think about relationship, we think, that's my relationship. I have these friends. But in actual fact, Jesus calls us into relationship with himself and relationship with his creation, his people. So they're his relationships, and he includes us in those. He trusts us with those. When I think about some of the relationships I have, I think, wow, Jesus was so kind to me because he has included me uh, into his relationships with people that are extraordinary to me, that are really remarkable, that really love Jesus and do important things in the world and I get to be their friend and I get to be a part of that and, and I get to do that with them. And, um, you know, when Jesus called the individual, he called at first the individual to a group of three others and that was God the Father, God the Son and himself. But then he called 12, right? And then we know about the 70, and then we know that there's a crowd that starts to form, and now we have lost count, right? What is that? It's exactly what God said at the beginning, let us make man in our image. And he called the 12, if you like, and and he called us to be with him, and he called the 12 to do something else. And this is really important because this is part of our destiny, okay? So he calls us to himself, and that's how we discover who we are. That's how we get to know a little bit about how amazing God's creation in us is. But he also called the 12, and he sent them out to preach or to talk or to share and to have authority, And they were given authority to do something, to drive out evil. The Bible says to drive out demons. If you want to read about that, you can find out about that in Mark 3, 14 and 15. So they were called, and we were called to God, but we were also called or sent, if you like, out to preach, to share. To share not about religious ideology, but to share about Jesus. And to share about Father God who loves so much that he sent Jesus. We're to share what the Bible calls good news. But the good news is a person. And it's if we're linked so strongly into that relationship, and if this is about that human relationship that God included us in with himself, then what we're sharing about all the time with other people is about a relationship that we have that Jesus is sending out so that more and more people can know about that relationship and be included in it. You know, this authority that we're given is important because often when we're trying to create destiny, we sort of try and huff and puff and create our own, you know, great thing. (laughs) And, um, you know, some of us have got skills where we can sort of achieve certain things. We've had certain types of education or we're just really practical And whatever we're given to do, we can work out a solution because God's made us to be clever that way. And um, I'm surrounded by a lot of intelligent, clever, practical people. And, uh, you know, I often stand in awe of them and think about the gift of God within them. But when we talk about what God gives us, there's something uh, far more than our natural ability that is placed in our life. It's authority. It's not something we can gain. It's something that he gained for us. It's his authority over sin and death. And so that when he sends us out, he's sending us out in his authority to be able to include more and more people in relationship and to really uh, rescue them, if you like, uh, from, from the pit of hell and bring them into a loving family relationship. Uh, that's for all of us. You know, it's quite remarkable. You know, I don't know if you're, if you're sort of made to be a little bit suspicious, you know. Some people use this expression, that sounds too good to be true. I must have to do something to get that. 
I must have to sort of, you know, jump up and down in a certain way, uh, you know, use certain language, tilt my head a certain way. I've got to do something to earn that, right? Because most things in the world, most things in Satan's kingdom, you've got to give away your soul to get it. But with this, we give, we come into relationship. We, we're restored back into the relationship with the living God. And then he begins to give us authority to, to be able to help others to come into that. In Mark, Jesus calls the individual, you know, in the book of Mark, you see it highlighted over and over again where Jesus calls the individual. And it seems to me that he calls them very, very clearly in the book of Mark to two things. And this is really important for us tonight because if we're lacking this, then it really is going to affect our identity and it's going to affect our future. The first thing is intimacy. And what, what, God is, what Jesus is calling his disciples to and us as his disciples is he's calling us into intimacy. You know, sometimes we think, okay, he's calling us into boom, 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 do these things, jump through these hoops. But no, he's calling us to intimacy. He's calling us to himself. When you talk about intimacy, it's something really close. It's something uh, that is uh, very precious. It's something that we'd fight for. It's really important. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. It's not, it's not some distant, uh, non-feeling thing. It's something very close. It's something very beautiful. But, you know, how you experience intimacy and how I experience intimacy will be quite different because of how God's made us. You know, with some people, they experience intimacy just through talking and sharing. Others, in the quietness, just the quietness of the moment, they experience intimacy. You know, there's many ways we experience intimacy. Sometimes with a glance, sometimes through a smile, uh, sometimes when someone notices us as we're, walk, as we're walking past them. But intimacy, where God says, come and be with me. And with everybody else that, I, that I've brought to myself. Come, come and just be with me. That's amazing, isn't it? it? It doesn't have rush associated with it. But it has that wonderful promise that he doesn't want us to feel alone. He wants us to feel like a child that belongs. A child that's cared for. A child that has the right to intimacy. The, the second thing that Jesus really calls people to, and to me this is really exciting because, you know, some people are a little bit wary of heaven. You know, they think, are we just going to stand around the whole time and worship? You know, I, I struggle to worship for, you know, 15 minutes. I struggle to pray for 10. You know, don't worry about that. In heaven, we're not going to have that struggle. We're going to be face to face, and he's pretty glorious, you know. He's going to take our breath away. It's going to be marvelous. We don't need to overthink that. But here, right now, he calls us to intimacy with him, and he calls us to impact. He gives us purpose. He says, go and do with him and with one another. So the one another is always there because it's this circle of relationship including Jesus, right, who's leading us. But at times it's intimacy and at times it's high impact where we go and we do things with him that are going to really um, bring, bring the world uh, into a greater and greater understanding of his love for them and the fact that he came that we could have relationship. You know, the thing about this impact deal, though, that we're called to have impact, I think about that a lot, and I've talked to God about it a lot, because I feel like he's taking a great risk with me at times. And uh, I wonder why he does it. And I can only come to one thing. He loves the relationship. And he believes in me. And he gives me trust. And he gives me an opportunity to have a go. And he wants me to go with him. So you and I have been given a lot of trust. And um, with that trust, we don't determine the outcome of our lives. He does. Because what he's doing is he's trusting us with what he wants done on the earth. And, 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 and he's trusting us to communicate his love to those that haven't yet had that opportunity to know. It's incredible trust. 
And you know, there are so many that fail God in that, where we don't, we don't um, follow through on the, what he wants us to do, the impact that he's called us to have in the world. Uh, we break trust, if you like. Um, we don't care about God's outcomes. Uh, we don't care about how God wants this to end. Uh, what we start caring about more is our life, our decisions, and how we want to live it. Um, you know, sometimes we think that the outcome is in our hands. It's not. It's really not, unless we choose to take that right back. But it really is his outcome, and he really trusts us to follow him and go with him in that. Um, you know, you can't create your own authority because it's, we don't have that. It's his authority. Uh, and, you know, the reality is if we're following Jesus closely, we don't have authority. We serve under authority. He is the authority of all authorities. We serve under his authority. And any favor that we get, we get because we're serving under his authority. Any incredible miracles that take place, they take place because we're serving under his authority. But wow, what an exciting place that is to be. And we see exciting things happen and we see things uh, happen that shouldn't happen uh, through us. But it's because of his authority. It's because we're serving under that authority. You know, Paul describes uh, this a little in 1 Corinthians 9. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to what the Apostle Paul talks about here. He's, he's, he's a preacher, yeah? And uh, he, he was someone that was, uh, the Bible calls an apostle. In other words, he was sharing, he was sharing the good news. He was sharing... Uh, with those that have never heard about this great love, this great encounter that he had with Jesus. And, and he just went further and further and further uh, to share that. And um, in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verses uh, 16 and uh, 17, he, he says this. Let me just try and uh, grab that. Yeah, it's about his preaching. He says, yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. That's what Jesus called Paul to himself to do. Apart from the intimacy, this was going to be Paul's impact. And he says, I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. He goes on to say, if I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. You know, I think Paul had the right thinking because he realized that if he wasn't doing what God had called him to do, it would be terrible for him. Okay, it would be a bad decision. <laughs> and he would be in a bad way. And we know that before he started to do what, he'd be, what he was uh, created to do, he was in a bad way. He was really mixed up. He, he really was confused. And he was doing all sorts of stuff that actually in the end uh, brought him to a place where he was doing things against God, not for God. And you know, there are many people that, you know, start out really well in their Christian life, but they end up becoming these cynical people that are quite a distance from God. They even start questioning, is God real? How, would, how could that be possible when someone's had this incredible encounter with God, where the love of God has touched them and changed them? Easy, just stop doing what you're called to do. Just stop doing it. Because it's not just about your call to intimacy, it's about your call to do what God wants you to do with his outcomes, his way, and his authority. And when we... When we when we find out what that is, we should give our lives to it. When we find out what that thing is, we need to give our lives to it. But many people, even though they've started out well, they don't finish well with that. And then they lose their way, but they also lose their way in their understanding of God. But Paul here says, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm compelled by God. In other words, I've been called by God. I, can boast, I can't boast about this. Uh, and um, 
If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment, but I have no choice. You know, it talks here about, um, oh, where is it? Uh, how terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. So that's what Paul was called to do. And he understood the, the terrible um, outcome of not doing what God had called him to do. And, you know, identity and destiny are, are front and center in the middle of what God has called you to do. And I want to tell you, you have an enemy against that because that's when you fully start to grow into what you were born for. That's where you start to mature as a person. That's where you start to grow up on the inside out. That's when you become larger than your natural height and where your spirit becomes bigger than you would be normally. When you are understanding that you're loved by God and when you're understanding that you're fully within the call of God upon your life. Um, you know, in Acts 20, 20, Paul also talks about being constrained by the Spirit. So this whole idea, he uses these two words, compelled and constrained. And you know, you know when, you, when God has lost, when, when you've wiggled out of the grip of God. You and I know that even, we, even, even if we're not willing to admit it. And we start to use all sorts of reasons, but the reality is we've wiggled out of the grip of God. We're no longer allowing ourselves, our spirit to be compelled by the Spirit of God to do the thing that He wants us to do. And we're no longer allowing ourselves to be constrained by the Spirit of God. Uh, we've, we've, we've wiggled our way out of that constraint. That constraint is not a bad thing. That is purpose. That's destiny. That's what we've been born uh, to do. And, um, and it's actually that we've been born to do something that is quite extraordinary. And, uh, you know, Paul did extraordinary things in his life. And, uh, you know, you and I are sitting here because he followed and he had high impact. And as a result of his high impact in his life, you and I... Um, have had the privilege of, uh, in our nations, of hearing the gospel because that wave continued to go beyond Paul and go further and further and further and further uh, with those that he'd shared the good news with. You know, it's, it's more of a challenge to do God things God's way. It is more of a challenge. I, I, I would be wrong not to say that because, you know, there's so much pressure around us to do it our way. Uh, the, this, the world that we live in is selfish, and um, it does have a lot of selfish language. And, you know, unfortunately, that can even creep into the Christian world where we have selfish language. It, it, it is more of a challenge to do God's things God's ways. But I, I've, I've lived long enough now to know that it's worth it in the end. If we put the effort in, it's worth it in the end. That God's will, God's way always produces his outcomes. And they're magnificent and they take your breath away. They're incredible. And they're always beyond what you could ever achieve in your lifetime by yourself. They're always much bigger because it's got to do with God and his bigness and his greatness. So, you know, there's a couple of thoughts that I want to talk to you about tonight with that as my context I want to firstly say don't yield to the temptation to shortcut this process with God. As I was praying for you, I felt like there were people in the meeting tonight that are in danger of yielding to the temptation of shortcutting the process of God in their lives. They become impatient, uh, they become disheartened, or they've just decided that I don't want to do this anymore. And what you're starting to do is allow uh, God's process in your life to be shortcutted. In other words, to be the direction of it to change. You know, when we shortcut God's process in our life, when we yield to the temptation of that, uh, what we're yielding to really is the mo we, 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 we have to model something. And if we're not modeling God, if we're not imitating God, we will model the world around us. And what happens when you do that is you model uh, yourself around the world's wisdom rather than God's wisdom. 
Have you ever sat and just listened to uh, leaders of our nations recently? Or have you ever sat and uh, listened to people that are regarded as professors of this or professors of that? You know, you'll hear when there is no God in their thinking and when they're not following God, the conclusions they come to as regarded by the world around them as very intelligent people, it's just really foolish. It just doesn't make sense and it lacks wisdom. But yet without God, we draw foolish conclusions and we model ourselves after what we think is the world's wisdom. We start to be really attracted to that because we think, okay, then I'll make a name for myself. But in actual fact, friends, you and I weren't born to make a name for ourselves. We were born to come to, to, come to God, to come into relationship with God. Remember, our origin is let us make man in our own image so that we can share our love with man, so that we can, you know, so that we can create this circle of relationship, so that we can be with him and be about the things that our father is about and and be like him in his character and his nature. But when we start to drift away from that and we start to get tempted, Uh, we shortcut God's process in our life and, you know, we can end up quite bitter saying God failed us, but he doesn't ever fail if we stay intimate with him and if we follow his call. When God approaches you and I, he makes covenant with us and um, covenant is like this promise, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And, and, and he does that with us as individuals, but he also does that uh, with, the, with uh, movements that he births on the earth. You know, uh, more and more in Youth with a Mission, we're starting to discover uh, that actually when God uh, gave a vision to a man called Lauren Cunningham uh, to, to uh, start to uh, mobilize young people uh, across the earth in mission, Um, that actually God came to Lauren and made a covenant with him, a promise that, son, if you stay close to me in these things, I will do this. I will do this. And, you know, we're seeing a little bit of that. But it was about a covenant. It was about a relationship. And this mission is called to have relationship with God that actually goes beyond anybody's vision. And actually, it'll go beyond, vision won't survive this type of relationship. And you know, in the world that we live in, sometimes even just our values can turn into rules and they won't survive. Not that they're bad, they're wonderful. But what God has called us to is covenant relationship with him. Where we enter that relationship in intimacy and we remain in that intimacy and we follow him. And then... God can grow and he can multiply the workers for his purposes. So sometimes God takes a group of people and he creates movements. But he always starts with an individual. And, you know, he's looking for committed people. Destiny is not singular singular anymore. It's not about just me anymore when we commit ourselves to the Father. It becomes about him and it becomes about what he wants. And we find our identity and our destiny in that circle of relationship. And you know, for me, I can absolutely say that my identity in relationship with God is what defines me. I have no other definition. It really is what defines me. And then what happened was that God brought all these amazing relationships into my life. And so I get to share uh, in those relationships in the purposes of God, and it's absolutely incredible. Uh, You know, there's a scripture in the Bible in 2 Kings, and I I just want to take a quick look at it, 2 Kings 17. And um, it's not such an encouraging scripture, so, you know, sorry about that. Uh, But I just want to share it um, uh, just to because I think it gives a good explanation of um, the problem that we deal with when we fail to remain intimate with God and remain in our destiny. Um, 
So 2 Kings 17, verses 14 and 15. Um, here we have um, a group of God's people who stop listening. And so it says, but, but the Israelites would not listen. Uh, they were as stubborn as their ancestors who had refused to believe in the Lord, their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they despised all his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols, so they became worthless themselves. Now, God is not saying his people are worthless. This, what is happening here is that when we move out of intimacy with God, we replace God with worthless things. And that makes us feel worthless. We start to feel terrible about ourselves and who we are and what we're about. And we get confused and we lose our way and we make poor decisions. And we really believe the lie of the enemy that we're worthless. And there's not one person in this room that is worthless. But if we stop listening to God, if we stop being in that place of intimacy with God, if we stop following him, uh, then we're going to eventually find ourselves along the road feeling that way because we will surround ourselves with other things. We'll start worshipping something if we're not worshipping God. And, you know, I felt like God wanted to say tonight that we need to guard our intimacy with him. It's kind of like we've got to put up, you know, um, guards and say nothing will touch my intimacy with God. And that's something we have to wake up every day and make a decision about. And um, the other thing is we need to guard our circle of relationships, the people that God has provided for us, because they're important too. Um, God's provided them. He's brought us into a circle of relationships, and we need to give ourselves to those people. We need to love them. We, we need to care for them as we together, um, you know, do things uh, that are important to God. Um, I want to I close with one man's story, and uh, it's a guy called Joseph. How many know about Joseph in the Bible? Anybody know about Joseph in the Bible? Who's Joseph in this room? Is there a Joseph here anywhere? Uh, no one's putting their hand up. Maybe you don't want to have the same outcome as Joseph here. Yeah? But, you know, if you want to read about Joseph, you could read about him in... Uh, uh, Genesis 37, 2 to 11. And, um, but, you know, as a young man, you know, he was a favoured son of his father and uh, he had a whole bunch of older brothers and um, uh, he had a dream. He was a bit of a dreamer, Joseph. And um, um, the story of his whole life that was going to happen uh, came to him as a young man, you know, it wasn't something that, you know, he stepped into step by step. Actually, as a young man, he had a dream. And, um, and uh, his whole life that was going to happen before him uh, came uh, to him in a dream. And, you know, God often spoke to Joseph in dreams. And he was this dreamer uh, type of guy. You know, I don't know what you think of dreamers, but uh, Joseph was really used by God. And it was really a word from heaven that he gave him uh, in the form of a dream. But, you know, as I was praying tonight, I felt like God said that this auditorium is full of dreamers. And um, God's pleased with that. He likes that. Because it requires uh, the humility of a childlike heart to dream. And, uh, you know, we're in a safe place when we dare to dream and we have the humility to dream. And it's like we're a little child, you know, and uh, Father God, we're... I'm dreaming about this and I'm dreaming about that. And you may not have come into this auditorium tonight thinking that you're a dreamer, but God says you are. You're a little bit like a Joseph and, um, and he loves that and he wants to encourage that in you. But the thing that we learn through Joseph is that the dream doesn't instantly come to fulfillment. Uh, you know, it wasn't an instant thing, you know, like you just add hot water and Bavum, Joseph, you know, fast forward, had lived his life and it worked out really well and he became this really important person in the, in the nation of Egypt. It, it, didn't, it didn't work out like that. Um, it didn't instantly come. Um, and, you know, 
for us who have dreams, uh, a little bit like Joseph, the enemy knows that you have a dream. Or the enemy knows that God wants to give you dreams. Maybe, maybe you don't have it all mapped out yet, but God is wanting to give you dreams. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to absolutely destroy it. He wants to absolutely destroy the dream of God. For some of us sitting here, you may feel like it was already destroyed, but God can rebirth it for you because his dreams over your life don't change. Even though we can move away from them and we can depart or we can be in danger of that, his dreams never change. And, um, you know, with the enemy, when he tries to destroy dreams, he, he doesn't come in through the front door. It's not real obvious, right? He's too smart for that. So it's not like he's right in your face right here and, oh, there's the enemy and we sort of, you know, say get lost. It's not like that. He, he normally finds a way to come in the back door of our lives and to murder our vision and to murder our hopes and our dreams. The enemy wants to abort the dream of God through you and I even before it's fully birthed, you know. And uh, with Joseph, there was a 13-year gap. And um, that's a big gap. And during that time, there was intense warfare over his life. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe you experience or have experienced intense warfare over your life. I know I have. And there's seasons of it where I experience intense warfare uh, when God's just about to, uh, I think, bring, bring you into a, a more of that vision and that dream of God uh, through you. At times there's warfare, but at times there's also intense travail uh, to birth a vision, you know, and um, to bring it into its full uh, form. And, uh, you know, we have pregnant women in this room and we know they have a baby underneath a lump that's in front of their stomach. But one day soon, hopefully, they're going to travail uh, over that uh, baby being born and they're going to have this beautiful little human being before them that's going to start to grow and uh, they're going to notice personality and things that are like them and it's just going to be this beautiful, incredible discovery. And... Um, so there's intense travail to birth the vision. And I know for us in this location, when you look at us as a mission, there's been intense travail uh, over vision. There's also been intense spiritual opposition over vision. And we still haven't seen the full completion of the vision. Uh, it's a beginning of a movement that will continue well beyond our lifetime. Uh, but... The point is, it doesn't just normally happen like we think it does. And we've got to get on our knees to find our destiny. We've got to travail with God. We've got to deal with enemies of our soul. You know, in Genesis 39, Jace, Joseph had favor with Potiphar. But guess who Potiphar was? He was the prison guy. <laughs> so he had favor with the guy that was in charge of the prison. And, you know... Yeah, he had favor, but he was still a slave in Egypt. And, um, you know, for some of you in this room, I believe that you're in a season right now where you're receiving vision. You haven't seen it happen yet. You know, with Joseph, he had received the vision and he ended up in prison. He, his brothers nearly killed him. Uh, you know, he was given the entire prison because he had favor to be, to be in charge of. And, uh, but you think about it, he'd already had the dream of his life before him. He already knew that dream and the promises of God, but yet he was in a prison. Yeah, he had favor, but he was in a prison. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. The sense of frustration of knowing uh, there was not, that he was not in the full vision of God. Uh, you know, he maybe he tried to pray, maybe he tried to fast himself out of that prison, I don't know. But after the praying, after the fasting, he still ended up in the same place. And, you know, for some of us, maybe we're in a, still in a prison type season. A prison was a place of preparation, though, for Joseph. It was an important place. 
You know, God had him there so that he could prepare him and test his heart to see what was in his heart and to see whether he'd remain loyal even through difficult times. And, you know, Joseph was pretty incredible in that. You know, three cheers for him. He was amazing because through those tests, through that season he went through, by faith he held on to the vision of God. And, um, you know, that's what God wants to say to us tonight. By faith, hold on to the vision of God because in it are your identity and in it is your destiny. You know, the enemy sows seeds of doubt. And sometimes we struggle with doubt. Sometimes we struggle with what the Bible calls unbelief. We stop believing for a while. Maybe we ask questions like, did, you, did, did I miss the will of God? You know, we're sort of feeling like we're having a hard day. Did I miss the will of God? Or uh, did God really say that to me? Did he really mean that? Uh, was I imagining that? You know, sometimes in, in believing uh, for our future, we have legitimate hardship. And I believe there's many people in this room that have experienced terrible hardship. Maybe from your background, maybe from the families that you've grown up in. Uh, and you may be still in that season, but God wants to say to you, I'm preparing you for great things ahead. I, I have a future and a hope for you. And, um, you know, there are prison seasons, but hold on. Um, don't ever surrender the will of God for your life. Don't ever surrender it. Don't ever give it up. Don't ever give it over for the sake of someone else's wisdom. Because if you do that, you'll wake up one day and wonder where the vision went. You know, for the, vi for, for the vision to go forward, it requires you as an individual to fight. You can't give up. And if you're part of a larger vision, you still as an individual, with all the relationships, all the circles of relationship that God has given you, you can't afford not to fight. You can't, you can't think, oh, well, everybody else around me is fighting. No, you have to fight too because God's called you into those relationships and into that vision. And as I was preparing tonight, I felt there are some who have had the enemy come in the back door. And I just, in closing, I just want you to listen to the areas that I felt God identified, um, which... Maybe you're struggling with, and if you are, you know, in just a moment, I'm going to invite Pete to come up and apply this word. But here were some of the things I felt, and there may be other things that, you know, God speaks to you tonight about uh, where you've lost your way and, or, you've, or you've, you've been tempted to shortcut the vision of God over your life. But I feel that there are some here who have a natural God-given passion but the enemy's come in the back door and your passion is gone. And you, you're blaming where you're at for that. But God wants to say to you tonight that it, that's the enemy and he's come in your back door. You've allowed him to come in the back door to steal your God-given passion. Uh, with others, I felt God was saying, you, you're, you're struggling with moodiness and grumpiness. <laughs> I know it's an unusual one, but I felt like God said, and you struggle with it on a regular basis. And the enemies come in your back door to steal your joy. And uh, you've accepted this as, well, you know, I have these circumstances and these people that I'm dealing with, but it has nothing to do with the people that you're dealing with. It's got to do with the enemy. And he's come in your back door and he's stolen your joy. And so when you look at your world, you see it through grumpy eyes. And you've allowed yourself the, uh, the privilege of being moody and up and down. The other one was, there are some that are cynical. What excited you doesn't excite you anymore. You know, maybe someone gives a report of something great that's happening on the earth and you just sort of sit there a little bit disinterested. You've wondered about it, but you haven't questioned it. You've just thought, oh, well, I've been around a long time. God doesn't want cynical people. He wants people that care about the good works that he's doing on the earth and care about the individual that's sharing that and what they're about. 
you know, I felt like God said the people that are struggling with being cynical, uh, what's starting to happen is you're starting to act like a spiritual old person and uh, you might be quite young, but you act like a spiritual old person. And uh, what's happened is the enemy has poured water on the fire and you need your fire back. You need your fire back so that you can get excited about what's happening on the earth, whether it's through you or not. Some have become cautious. You were once risk takers, but now you're more calculated. Some have resigned yourself to what you're doing. And you're not willing to take a risk anymore. You, there's no belief in what we're, and there's no belief in what you're doing anymore. You, you don't believe in it. And so you think, oh, well, maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't be here or wherever you are if you're a guest to, to, to us tonight. Uh, but actually what's happened is you've allowed yourself to just, you know, turn up each day uh, without faith in your heart. You have, you're not seeing things through the eyes of God anymore. And you start to excuse the vision of God. You, you think, oh, well, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And you resign yourself to saying this is the way it is. And I, and I think that there's this last category is that some have had a long, drawn-out fight over vision and you feel fatigued, you're tired. Uh, but... The enemy has stolen from you, and and I felt like what God says is you need to you need to pick up you need to pick up the fight again for the vision. It's your vision. You owned it and cherished it at some point, and you can't you can't distance yourself from it like it's your enemy because you feel fatigued. You've got to get back in the fight. You've got to get back in the race. Um, if we've privately carried frustration with God's process, the private frustration will spoil the vision. And, um, you know, I think about Moses when I say that, because Moses was faithful for a long time in the desert. Uh, but at the moment of breakthrough, he had a moment of frustration. And for Moses, it cost him the vision, and he didn't enter the promised land. When we're frustrated with people in the process, um, then we get angry with people. And uh, uh, it will rob us of vision because there's a lack of gratitude for what God has already done. And it ruins the blessing and, and all the good things that uh, vision brings with it, either individual or as a group. It makes us blind to other people in their process. And we don't encourage, we don't fight for people, we don't care anymore. And, um, you know, when God spoke to me to speak on identity and destiny tonight, I, I believe for some, you know, it's, you're just at the beginning of discovering who you are as you come into greater and greater intimacy with God. You're just at the beginning of discovering your impact in the world and what that's going to look like. But for others, you've been in this for a long time. And I believe that like Joseph, you're, exper you're you know, you, there's a process that you're going through and you're all at different stages. But I felt like God said the enemy has come in the back door. And you need to deal with the enemy tonight and you need to close that door so that everything that you've ever believed in, everything that you've ever dreamed about, everything that God has ever spoken, everything that God has ever uh, attached you to, in the vision of God on the earth, in his circle of relationships for you, that you can be front and center again to see that thing move forward for his purposes because there's more people that need to know about him and there's more people that need to know about his love and they don't need a group of people that have allowed the enemy to rob them. They need a group of people that are in faith, that are full of joy, that are full of intention for the purposes of God, that love that intimacy and love the privilege of being involved in impacting the earth in our generation. I'm just going to hand it over to Pete right now because uh, I believe that he's going to have the application. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure really what the application is tonight because there was 
a few little points that God told me to bring, but but I believe that, you know, God wants to speak to us tonight and maybe he already is speaking to you. Just to, just be open to the Spirit of God as we as we have this time of application. Thanks, Pete.